Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Calabrese, and welcome to this edition of Insights into Computer Science. Last time, we worked on some pretty interesting C programs when we explored structures and type defs. We saw how easy it was to create new variables that could be tailored to fit our specific application needs. Ultimately, we saw how we could make a new variable out of a structure, as we did with our student structure, and then use that new type to do interesting and more advanced things like make arrays of those structures and call them classes. This week, we want to try something even more interesting. We want to construct a linked list. Now, to make a linked list, we need to learn how to do two new things. First, how to create memory babies, and second, how to create self-referencing structures. Now, the first of these two is really pretty straightforward. Remember that C is a language of memory. Really, everything in C that makes it special is connected to how you can create interesting memory things. In your computer memory, the RAM is divided into the stack and the heap. When you declare variables in your C program, you are requesting memory that is from the stack. As such, that memory needs to be declared during the compile of the program before you run it and cannot be easily resized during execution. So when you use the instruction int x, you are asking the computer to reserve space from the stack's memory. Now the heap is much bigger than the stack it's essentially all of the unused memory that is available to your program. The heap is interesting because you can grab some anytime you need it. That's right, even during the runtime of your program. The only caveat is that you cannot give it a name like X. Rather, when you ask for it, the computer will return a pointer, and that points to the address of the memory that you have been granted. From that point forward, you can store things at that memory location using the agreed-upon pointer. Wow, that sounds confusing, right? Well, to make things easier, let's think of these memory locations as memory babies. When you request the memory during runtime, the computer grants you a memory block of the size you requested. Think of it like the old stories of the stork bringing the baby home to mama. Now, babies can't take care of themselves, so we do that for them. The same is true here. When the memory is granted, our memory baby is out in the heap all alone. The first thing that any good parent will do is give the baby a name. Now, think of yourself and your name. In my case, my name is Tom Calabrese. The Tom is nice, but it's largely unimportant because there are a lot of people in the world named Tom. But when I was a baby in the hospital, imagine that, what was more important to my parents was that I was associated with them. So the Calabrese part of my name made the connection and the nurse slapped the bracelet on my wrist that said I was a Calabrese and I pointed to Mama Calabrese. If they would have lost that connection, I would have been orphaned because as a baby, I really couldn't speak for myself. So it is with the memory baby. Once the memory baby is made, we point to it using a C pointer that is of the correct type. Once that is done, as long as that pointer is not lost, the memory baby can become a useful part of the data set. That sounds good. So now let's examine the mechanics of getting this done. First, we need to think about pointers in C. Pointers are used not only to point to the memory address, but also to pass on metadata about the thing they point to. So if you have a memory location that is connected to an integer, you need an integer pointer. If the pointer points to a character, then you need a character pointer. If the pointer points to a student type, then we need to use a student pointer. The reason for this is that the size of the memory needs to be associated with the pointer so that the system knows how much memory to consider when looking for data. Consider char star C pointer. This creates a pointer to a character type. 
Later, I can do something like car, ver1 is assigned the letter A. And I could then say C underscore pointer, or the C pointer we just created, is assigned the address of variable 1. Now, C pointer holds the address of ver1, and thus, it points to it. So, in this case, the value of var1 and the value at the location of C pointer are both A because they both point to the same thing. Now, remember those memory babies? If we want to create a memory baby, we use a malloc command. This command makes the request for a baby off the heap. Now, the command is somewhat complex, so let's try one. First, Let's define a type def to create the mapping for our new variable type. Let's use student underscore t type that we used from the last lesson. Now, inside the main program, we need to create a pointer for this type of variable so that the malloc has a place to return the pointer to the new memory baby. We do that with the command student underscore t, that's the type, space, asterisk, star pointer, semicolon. The asterisk or star indicates that the variable name, in this case, student underscore pointer, is a pointer type matching student underscore t. The malloc command returns the pointer via an assignment statement. So, student underscore pointer is assigned student t star malloc size of student t. Ooh, this command looks nasty, but really it's pretty straightforward. Let me read it to you in English. We can say malloc, or request memory from the heap, the size of the student underscore t type, and if granted, return a pointer of type student underscore t, and assign that pointer to student underscore pointer. Now, once this is done, student underscore pointer holds the address of the corresponding piece of memory. Next, we can use this structure that is out on the heap using the selection operator as we did before, except that we do not use the dot as the selection operator. Instead, we use the arrow because the structure is being pointed to. So in this case, to assign the GPA, we would say student underscore pointer, then the selection arrow, arrow selection indicator, which is an arrow, GPA equals 3.85, and of course we put a semicolon. This would go to the structure on the heap and place the 3.85 in the appropriate field. So now you know how to make a memory baby. Pretty cool. But we still have the problem we had before, where all of these individual memory babies are being pointed to, and now we need to track them all. Hmm. What do we do? Well, lucky for us, we can use linked lists. A linked list is simply a mechanism where we chain a collection of memory babies together, where one points to the next, points to the next, and so on. To do this, we need to rethink what a node, that is a fancy term for a structure, looks like. Once again, let's revisit the student underscore t definition, only this time let's call it node underscore t so that we use the more generic or familiar term. Type def struct node underscore t and then we populate it with the first name, last name, year, GPA, and a pointer called next and then close it with node underscore t semicolon. Notice that I added a line struct node underscore t star or asterisk next. This line is the key to making the structure or memory baby that we're going to malloc later able to be chained. This line basically says to the program, create a pointer and put it in this location that points to a node underscore t type. Now, the problem is you're asking for that pointer inside the definition of the structure as it's being processed. Now, that's why the node underscore t tag is at the front and the end of the structure or the type def. 
This gives the compiler a point of reference to measure from and thus calculate the length or number of bytes of the structure. So, now we can effectively chain these memory babies together. This prevents us from losing the pointers and enables us to create the linked list. Okay, one more thing. We need what is called the header of the linked list. The linked list can grow all at once, but at some point it needs to be anchored to a fixed place that we can start from, something with a name. This is called the header. The header is a structure that has a name, usually header, that points to the first element of the linked list. Since the header is a structure, it can also contain some metadata or things about the list, like how many nodes it contains or a count. To build this, we simply declare it inside the main program. So for example, struct header, and then the curly brackets, and then our first element is a pointer to the first node of the header, specified as node underscore t for the type, space, asterisk, front underscore pointer. So that front pointer is of type node. An integer count, the curly brackets, and the header. Now, I will create a pointer called new pointer and another called current pointer for use in the program. So again, we're just going to create two pointer types, node underscore t star po new pointer, node underscore t star current pointer. I now have two variables, new pointer and current pointer, that are of type node underscore t. Now we can do the following. New pointer is assigned, then we have the node underscore t star malloc size of node underscore t. This creates the memory for the new memory baby and returns the pointer in new pointer. Nothing different than we did before. Now, once we did this, and then say we wanted to create another memory baby in the future and put it in the chain, the first thing we have to do is check to see if the header is currently empty, meaning that the points to null, or is it pointing to a node already? So to check that, we would write a little piece of code if header.front underscore pointer equal equal null, then take the new pointer and assign it to that location. So header.front underscore pointer is assigned whatever the new pointer was that was returned from the malloc. This is now the first node in the chain. And then, of course, we would increment the header.count to indicate that we have another node in the chain. In this case, it would be one. Otherwise, we continue with the code. This code checked if the header was empty, and if it was, it added the new node to the front of the chain and then incremented the count. If we do another malloc, so we're going to create, say, a second or third or nth baby, this baby needs to be chained into the linked list. So again, we would check if the link is empty. Since this time it's not, we will traverse or follow the chain looking for a null in the next field, remember that field, from our structure of the node and place the new pointer there. To traverse the list, we should use our second temporary pointer, the one called cur underscore ptr. This will be used to point to the current node that we're examining so that we can see, is this node the end of the chain or not? To do this, first, set the current pointer to point to wherever the head front pointer is pointing. Make the assignment, car pointer is assigned, header dot front pointer, and of course we need our semicolon. Then the code would continue. If the next field that current pointer is pointing to. So if the first node in our chain has a next field that is equal to null, then assign the new pointer to the current pointer's next field and increment the header.count. Otherwise, the current pointer that we have now, or the new current pointer, we're going to update the current pointer, is assigned the current pointer next field. So if there are two nodes, 
the first node's next field points to the second one, and we want that to be the location of the current pointer so that we can examine that node. And then this stays inside a loop, and that would allow us to do this over and over again until we reach the end of the chain. And that's where you'd find the next field would have a current pointer equal to null. And at that point, we would assign the next pointer to that node, and then the chain would continue to grow. Essentially, just repoint the current pointer to point to wherever the next field in the current node is pointing, and then we are set for the next iteration. Of course, this code would be placed inside a loop that would continue until the new node is placed. Then the function to insert the node would return, and that would be it. In addition to inserting a new node, you will need to create functions like this one that will delete a node or and of course, preserving the pointer. So when we take a node out, the pointer that pointed to the remove node needs to be pointing to the one it was pointing to. Traverse the list, which means visit each node and report or print what's there. We need to have a search function to find a specific node based on a key. We can create a function to return the count of nodes to determine if the list is empty or full in the extremely unlikely event that memory runs out after the malloc is executed and can't complete. The code for creating a linked list seems complicated, and in C you do need to write quite a bit of code to make all the functions that I just described. But fear not, this is also classic code and can be found online everywhere. A nice source of the code with documentation can be found at Zentut. Check it out. This code can easily be modified with your particular linked list application in mind and does not, and it does all the things that we've been discussing. Now you know how a linked list works and the specifics of how to build one. You may be asking yourself, why do I need this? Or is it worth the effort? <laughs> the answer is most definitely yes. First, linked lists are built from the heap. So the only real size limit you have is how much RAM your computer has. And you will never, in all likelihood, test that limit. So unlike arrays, linked lists just go on and on and on. Second, linked lists are easy to customize. You can have a linked list like the one we just created, known as a linear linked list, that preserves the order of arrival and just tacks new data at the end of the list. This is handy when building software that accumulates readings from a device, like a diabetic monitoring system that gets blood readings each interval and wants to save them in order. You can have an ordered linked list where insertion or searching is based on a key. A key is just taking one of the fields in the node and using it to test to determine the order. So say alphabetical by last name. An ordered list can make searching faster, but the insertion is a bit tricky with respect to reassigning pointers. There are circular lists that can be used in buffering systems, doubly linked lists where you can move backward or forward through the list because we specify an extra set of pointers in the node definition. We can have arrays of linked lists such as can be found in a data structure known as a hash table. These are often used as the primary data structure for routing tables in network devices. Linked lists and arrays are two of the most important data types because from them we build advanced data types that bring the most power to our creations. These would include the aforementioned hash table, queue, stacks, trees, and graphs. In part three of this tutorial on linked lists, we will look at the code for building hash tables. Hash tables enable amazingly fast searches and are really interesting to examine. So until next time,